Hello and welcome back. Today we're doing the second half of the calculations involving the mole. This includes the ideal gas equation and the empirical and molecular formulae. Let's begin with the ideal gas equation. PV equals NRT. Unfortunately for you, the mighty AQA have decided that you need to remember this equation. But after learning how it works and seeing the relatively limited amount of things they can ask you about it, it is not going to be too much of a problem. The five letters in the equation stand for the following. P stands for pressure. V stands for volume. N stands for the number of moles. R stands for the gas constant which is just a number, and T, you may have guessed it, stands for temperature. The thing is though, these quantities must be in their SI units. If you've never stumbled across the phrase SI before, then not only are you definitely not doing A-level physics, but you don't need to worry. It's just a set of units we use to measure things as a standard across the world. It avoids confusion and makes things more simple. All of the quantities in question in the ideal gas equation have their own units that we use worldwide. They go as follows. Pressure is in pascals. Volume is in meters cubed. Moles is in moles because moles is the standard unit. R, like I just said, is just a number. The number though is 8.31. And don't worry, you are given this in the exam. And temperature is measured in Kelvin. You may well have noticed there that a few of those units aren't the conventional ones. Volume in the ideal gas equation is not in centimeters cubed or even decimeters cubed, which we became comfortable with in the last video. Temperatures in Kelvin and not degrees Celsius, which is what you typically use to measure temperature in your everyday life. This becomes a problem because the equation only works if everything's in the correct units. So predictably, AQA love giving you stuff in the questions where the units aren't correct and they expect you to convert. But right now, we're gonna go through everything you need to be able to convert between. Let's start with volume. To go from centimeters cubed to meters cubed, you divide by a million. To go from meters cubed back to centimeters cubed, you multiply by a million. The best way to understand this is to have an imaginary box with one meter width, one meter depth, and one meter height. To find the volume of that box, you would multiply the length, width, and height, and you'd end up with a volume of one times one times one, which is just one meter cubed. But if we convert those meters into centimeters on each of the sides, 100 centimeters being one meter, you end up doing 100 times 100 times 100 to find the volume of the box. And would you look at that? You end up with a million centimeters cubed. What about decimeters cubed to convert from meters cubed to decimeters cubed, you only multiply by a thousand. When it comes to pressure, this explanation isn't very necessary. The units you need to use, pascals, are often the ones given to you in the question, and if not, they're only going to be in kilopascals. And like one kilometer is 1,000 meters, one kilopascal is 1,000 pascals. The fact that temperatures in Kelvin introduces a strange conversion factor. To change from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273 to your number in degrees. That's because the temperature of zero Kelvin is the same as minus 273 degrees Celsius. This temperature may seem arbitrary and out of nowhere, but it is the temperature in which particles have no kinetic energy. This is certainly beyond the scope of this video, and it comes into play further in thermodynamics in year two. But for now, the conversion is all you need to worry about. To change from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273 to your number. Now what we're gonna do is combine this unit conversion knowledge, the knowledge of the equation itself, PV equals NRT, with what we learned last lesson, and therefore run through a typical example of an exam question. In the exam question we've got here, we're told we've got 250 milligrams of sodium, and it's being added to 500 centimeters cubed of water at 25 degrees Celsius. It says a gas was produced. Give an equation for the reaction that occurs, and then calculate the volume in centimeters cubed of the gas formed at 101 kilopascals and then it tells us the gas constant r the first thing you may be thrown off by is the fact that the volume of water is given and you may be thinking that isn't in pv equals nrt at all and that's because in question 8.3 down here you are asked to calculate the concentration of the solution formed the first thing you need is a balanced equation as we learned last lesson that's the only way we can learn the molar ratios but the specific equation that you need for this question is learn in year two, the period three topic. So I'm just gonna give you the equation. Two moles of sodium react with two moles of water to form a mole of hydrogen and two moles of sodium hydroxide. In the exam, that equation's worth one of the six marks available. So everything we've learned already will allow us to get the next five. And by the time you finish the course, that equation is just gonna be second nature. The first thing we're gonna do is write down all the information we may well need. We've got 250 milligrams of sodium. We've got a pressure of 101 kilopascals. We've got 25 degrees Celsius as our temperature, and we're trying to find volume. As I've done here, writing out all of the letters to the equation, you can see what we're missing is volume and moles. Now, obviously this is the ideal gas equation, so we're trying to find how much gas is made. 
The only gas in this question is hydrogen. So how are we going to calculate the moles of hydrogen produced? Well, we know the mass of sodium. 250 milligrams, it's telling us in the first line. So if we calculate the moles of sodium, we can see that there is a two to one ratio between sodium and hydrogen. So therefore, we can take the moles of sodium, divide that by two, and find our moles of hydrogen. So let's find the moles of sodium now. 250 times 10 to the minus three, which is the same as 250 milligrams. We're dividing that by the AR of sodium, which is 23.0. That gives us the amount of moles, 0.0108695 going onwards, but that's enough significant figures. As I said a second ago, we can see a two to one ratio. There is a two in front of the sodium and a one in front of the hydrogen, which we can't see, but it's there. So therefore two moles of sodium make one mole of hydrogen. Therefore we're gonna divide the value of our moles of sodium by two. We get 0.00543475, blah, onwards, onwards, onwards. That's enough significant figures. So we're gonna fill that in to the N in our list of the letters. Pressure's been given in kilopascals, and we need to turn that into pascals. So 101 times 1,000, 101,000 pascals. Temperature has also been given in Celsius. We need to convert that into Kelvin. Temperature, like I said, you have to remember the conversion, unfortunately. Add 273 to get 298 Kelvin. Now we can just plug the numbers into the equation. 101,000 times V, which is what we're trying to find, equals NRT, so 0.0054375. That's the moles of hydrogen. Multiplied by R, which is 8.31. Multiplied by T in Kelvin, which is 298. We're going to rearrange this equation by dividing both sides by 101,000 and end up with this nasty looking thing. But at the end of the day, that is just multiplication and division. Put it into your calculator and we end up with 1.33252 times 10 to the minus four. Volume has to be in centimeters cubed. So we use the conversion factor we just learned, which is times by a million. And we end up with the final answer of 133.25 centimeters cubed. That is as complicated as PV equals NRT gets. If you feel like you need more practice, that's fine. You can just head over to our website, which is linked in the description below. Okay, now it's time to deal with the empirical formula and compare it to the molecular formula. The empirical formula is defined as the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound, whereas the molecular formula is the actual number of atoms of each element in a compound. It's easier if we go with an example. Let's talk about a molecule of glucose. Its molecular formula is C6H12O6. That tells us the total number of atoms present in one molecule of glucose. We can clearly see there's six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. Its empirical formula is gonna be the simplest ratio of six to 12 to six. If we divide all those numbers by six, we can see that that is CH2O. What is very clear to see there is you have no idea about the total amount of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen atoms present in a glucose molecule, just the ratio. At this level, there is absolutely zero use for the empirical formula aside from calculating it. But later on down the line in your chemistry journey, if you choose to do a degree, doing big calculations involving large organic molecules will be made much easier by the empirical formula. What we're gonna do now is look into an actual method of how to calculate the empirical formula for every type of question you may be given in the exam. First, we're gonna do it when you're given the mass. This question says, determine the empirical formula of a compound that contains 10 grams of hydrogen and 80 grams of oxygen. What you do every time you're asked an empirical formula question is lay out a grid like this. Five total lines. Line one, mass. Line two, AR. Line three, moles. Line four, divide by the smallest. And line five, multiply until whole. Across the top, you're gonna write the atoms in question. Then on line one, the mass, you are told that in the question. For hydrogen, it is 10 grams. And for oxygen, it's 80 grams. Line two, we write the AR, refer to the periodic table to find this. Oxygen is 16, hydrogen is one. Line three is moles. And as we know, moles is mass over AR. So we just divide line one by line two. In this case, we got 10 moles of hydrogen and five moles of oxygen. The line divide by the smallest just means divide the number of moles obtained of each of these atoms by the smallest amount of moles. So hydrogen is gonna be 10 divided by five and oxygen is just five divided by five. Multiply until whole doesn't apply here because you can see that the answers were two and one. Sometimes you can have 2.5 and 3.5 and you have to multiply them both by the same amount until you get a whole number. But those numbers we've just found, two and one, are the empirical formula of this compound. H2O1 
or just H2O. This isn't telling us we've got H2O as in water. It's just telling us the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is two to one. You can also be asked to find the empirical formula given percentage masses. In this question, you've been asked to determine the empirical formula of a compound containing 85.7% carbon and hydrogen. You might be sitting there going, I don't know how much hydrogen there is, but if you think about it, all percentages need to add up to 100, so it must be 14.3%. The only difference is we replace the line that says mass with a percentage value. Carbon gets 85.7%, hydrogen gets 14.3%. We just treat that as if it was a mass in grams. We divide the percentage by the atomic masses, so 85.7 divided by 12 and 14.3 divided by 1. And we can see here there is 7.142 moles of carbon, 14.3 moles of hydrogen. Then we divide by the smallest value, in this case 7.142, to get a ratio of 1 carbon atom for every 2 hydrogen atoms. The empirical formula is CH2. The final thing you can be asked to do is calculate the full molecular formula from an empirical formula. The empirical formula of X is C4H10S, and the relative molecular mass of X is 180. What is the molecular formula of X? This is easy. The first thing we take is the AR data from the periodic table. Carbon is 12, hydrogen is 1, sulfur is 32. We can see there's a ratio of 4 to 10 to 1 for carbon to hydrogen to sulfur. If we add up 4 times 12, 10 times 1, and 32 times 1, we can see the relative empirical mass is 90. If we know the total molecular mass is 180, we can clearly see that it's just the empirical formula times by 2, because 90 times 2 is 180. That is everything for 3.1.2 amount of substance. I hope this has helped. And if you need exam questions, advice on getting into university, all these videos indexed neatly, all these videos in note form, advice on how to revise and so much more, head over to the website, www.educationc.xyz. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Goodbye.